Hi, and welcome to Jankin's God on Risk, a YouTube channel dedicated to the theory and practice of risk management. In this video, I'm going to discuss why you need a self-balancing risk model. Well, this is because it leads to unprecedented quality and reliability of uh, model outputs. And it's, uh, it's an opportunity for risk managers to greatly enhance their value to the rest of the organization. So there are plenty of uh, good reasons to pursue such a model. And you'll find um, an extensive discussion on this in, in uh, my book, Empowered Enterprise Risk Management, co-authored with uh, Petty Kapsta. There's also more information on my webpage, riskbudgeting.se. And as they say here on YouTube, please like and subscribe. Okay, so the setting for, for this discussion is that we're trying to implement something referred to as risk budgeting, by which is meant uh, the analysis of risk as viewed through the lens of the firm's financial performance. So we express risk use, using financial numbers, financial forecasts. And that involves cash flow, net income, balance sheets, and financial ratios. So we find ways to express risk using these, uh, these numbers, which allows us to, to move beyond the limitations of the risk register, which is how most firms approach risk management and they amass lots of information in this register, but it has uh, proven to be, um, have uh, lots of limitations when it comes to uh, expressing the extent to which the firm's performance is at risk. It's hard to aggregate risk uh, using the, the, uh, the risk register. It essentially is not designed for that purpose. Whereas uh, risk budgeting is specifically about that. We want to describe the risk of the firm as a whole, and we need um, financial numbers uh, to be able to do so. And Using this approach, we, we are able to investigate how risk will change as a result of scenarios. If the world changes, what will the company look like then? Uh, how are we going to um, make sure that we're able to meet our um, objectives and, and other threshold um, uh, levels of performance that are important for various reasons? And how risk changes as a result of corporate policy. I mean, that is a major driver of uh, risk, right? If managers decide to expand or increase leverage or pay a, a large dividend, all these uh, policies have, have major implications for, for the firm's risk return profile, right? But that ten, tends to bypass enterprise risk management style risk registers. They, they, they don't capture that. that, that sort of falls outside. So uh, risk budgeting is about developing a model for decision support that allows you to address these very important questions. So having a model that, that successfully can describe what happens to the firm's risk and return uh, profile uh, as a result of different scenarios and corporate policies, that combination is very powerful. So, so it's about decision support and, and uh, how to uh, achieve an attractive risk return balance for the risk as, uh, for the firm as a whole. And as should be clear from the preceding slide, you know, the, the, this requires a quantitative approach. We have to uh, keep track of, of um, these various outcomes using a model. There's, there's no way that we can do this back of the envelope or, or something like that. So it becomes a matter of how can we do this well? How can we build a, design a model that is useful for this purpose now to, to describe risk uh, as the, uh, for the firm as a whole and how that changes uh, as a result of scenarios and policies. We need a, a well-built model that will support this activity, right? So to, to get there, we need, uh, first of all, a complete set of financial statement forecasts because we will use financial um, <clears throat> numbers to express risk. That, that's how we will build up the risk return profile of this company. Right? And those numbers have to be uh, come with full accounting integrity in the sense that they, they, um, they reflect realistically actual accounting relationships. Um, such a model also has to have significant analytical integrity by which is meant, you know, that, that the, the various parts of the model hang together um, realistically. So, so for, for example, if revenue drops by 30%, 
how will your cost structure respond to that? The assumptions you make for, in that respect are, are quite important for, for the conclusions you're going to make about how risky your firm is and, and what policies are, are necessary. All right, so that takes analytical integrity. On top of that, we have to add a structure for risk analysis now, meaning that we will introduce risk exposures and variability into these numbers, and we will find ways to uh, construe risk, to, to define risk in this model and, and keep track of it, how that is affected by different scenarios and different policies. All right, so that will be um, on the agenda. Uh, we also want an interface then for scenario evaluation. We want to quickly be able to move between different scenarios, different possible future states of the world, and, and we want to know how the what the company would look like if that were to happen, and the model will inform us about that. So we want that kind of interface, user-friendly way to, to work with this. Uh, same thing for corporate policy evaluation. We want to switch between different corporate policies to investigate what happened or would happen with the corporate corporate uh, company's uh, risk return profile if we implemented that policy. So that will, compared to the current situation, that will lead to a new risk return profile and we can discuss uh, the, the desirability of that versus um, the company as is and so forth. That also requires a well thought out user interface and, and part of risk budgeting is, is to implement that. All right, so where we are today, the, we will discuss these Two components here, the uh, setting up a complete set of financial statements and ha having them, you know, reflect accounting in, in such a way that the, uh, the numbers are always uh, reliably and accurately describing the, what the company would look like. All right, but why would we then go for uh, accounting integrity and, and these uh, complete, complete interrelated financial statements? Well, the number one reason is that you, you get uh, a next level kind of reliability for your model outputs. I mean, we can start having some serious faith in the numbers, regardless of the scenario that is implemented or the uh, policy that is sort of added to the uh, setting here. And um, so it, it just enhances greatly the, the kind of um, reliability we can uh, expect from the model when we know that when, uh, whatever we assume is going to you know, realistically depict the company. And by insisting on such uh, accounting integrity, you know, along the way, we eliminate lots of errors and flawed assumptions. And in my experience, most financial models come with uh, that sort of, uh, you know, errors. And I have, I have reviewed and, and evaluated plenty of uh, financial slash risk models in my day. And I know that it's, they are hardly ever internally consistent. And, and some of these flawed assumptions, they bear on the risk management decision, like they, they affect how the risk return profile is presented to, to management, right? So we, we get rid of that. So we, we are able to visualize or describe the firm in any scenario now uh, of what the financial standing of, of, of this company would be in that scenario, regardless of we're talking about, uh, you know, worst case scenario or a super uh, boom, booming economy with great uh, increases in revenue. It doesn't really matter because if we have set it up in this way, it will depict it uh, as it would look under those circumstances. And building such a model here now, it, it kind of promotes or leads the way in, in an interesting way when it comes to integrated risk management because it forces you to integrate everything. And that changes your mindset. Uh, towards more integrated risk management. We're, we're all very siloed people, uh, you know, where this narrow interest and narrow uh, worldview to, to start out with. But as you build an integrated risk model, that will help you think holistically about the firm and its performance. So, so that it can be a great way to focus people's minds on, on, on integrated risk management and help them see how things are interconnected. So the, the model can actually lead the way. So that's another significant advantage. And the learning process can be absolutely fantastic uh, from, from setting up such a model. You, there are so many things that you, you know, where you lack an, an understanding uh, before you set out to do this, whereas you discover all these things um, 
and learn about them. And, and, and that is very beneficial for, for you as a risk manager and for the company as a whole to have that kind of person. So the, the learning process itself is, is a very big upside here from pursuing this kind of model. All right, so let's say we want to do this. Um, we have to choose uh, you know, some parameters here when we design the model, uh, time horizon, the resolution, are we talking monthly, quarterly, yearly sort of uh, observations in the model, and what kind of financial statements we would like to, to have in it. So in this case, we're just going to go for one year. I mean, that's a, most companies uh, at least look, try to look ahead one year, uh, lots more in, in some cases, but let's say one year for the sake of it. We're going to adopt a, a quarterly resolution, meaning that within that year, we're going to model every quarter. So the four quarters adding up to one year. Right? So the question is, how can we make sure that such a model now accurately describes the firm's financials and its performance uh, in all these scenarios? And whether or not we attach a, a certain case or certain assumptions regarding policies, you know, to, that's the challenge here, right? So, so regardless of what we assume, we want the model to be um, correct. And the way to go is to em embrace accounting. Uh, I, I'd have to say there, there was a time when I was uh, saw myself as a finance guy, a little bit too cool for, for accounting, but I, I know much better now. Accounting is, is um, incredibly helpful and it's the way you know people relate to the financials of the firm to a very large degree, right? So, so, so that's how people communicate and, and make sense of things and how they assess the company. Both insiders and outsiders use accounting numbers extensively, right? So, so we just have to um, realize that fact is it's not realistic to, to, to say that it's just accounting. It doesn't matter, only cash flows matter. That, that, that's not going to be the case. We, we need to uh, be able to show accurate numbers um, that are impacted by accounting standards. That's, um, um, that's very much my, my opinion here. And uh, okay, so, so what it means in practical terms is that we are not going to use some plug to capture any unexplained residual in the model. So if you just add lots of stuff to your model, all these lines, and they, but you don't set it up in such a way that they hang together, well then there's going to be some residual in the model and you want to get rid of that, so you plug the model, right? And that model will absorb all inconsistencies and errors in, in your model, but it will balance, so it will look okay. But that's not how we are going to do things. Rather, we're going to try to make the model IFRS consistent, so to speak, which, which means that we're going to look at how, how this works in IFRS accounting standards and, and, and try to, to the extent we can, have the model uh, reflect that. So then we're, we're um, that's how, how we achieve accounting integrity, basically. We look at the actual standards. So to go about building such a model, we, uh, we have to build it up from scratch, right? Or, or, and once you get some basics in place, you want to expand as you learn more things and you get more advanced, typically you add more and more stuff, right? Uh, but the principle here is that whenever we do so, whenever we decide to take it one step further and introduce more complexity and more realism to the model, well, we have to make sure that it self balances uh, in a way that reflects actual accounting relationship. So we're going to insist on that and never stop checking and never stop modeling until it balances. That's when we know that the model probably works, right? I mean, as long as it doesn't, then balance, you know, then, then we have a problem. We have to keep investigating and find out. Probably you have switched a sign somewhere or you've forgotten to include uh, something in a sum or, or something that there's some reason why your model isn't balancing. So you have to go check. But once it does, chances are greatly enhanced, you know, that, that, um, that, that it, the model is all right. So when does it self-balance? Well, what happens is that there, there will be transaction events and accounting events in the model as you forecast different cash flows and, and impairments or, or basically flow type variables that, that go on, you know, they happen at some point in time and, and that will have to affect stock, which is then the balance sheet. You know, the balance sheet will ref, need to reflect what, whatever event took place which you have assumed then in the forecast of your model. 
So the trick is to always find the appropriate way to integrate that event into the balance sheet. And there is a, there is a, going to be a certain way of, of doing that. And, and we just have to learn what the, um, what that way is. And well, here's a shocking conclusion then. You, your, your model is going to benefit from a shot of accounts to, to have some discipline um, in this process and, and, and think about it in a structured way. Why not set up a chart of accounts and, and then make sure that within that chart of accounts, uh, you are consistent. And you could uh, go for some generic IFRS type balance sheet. Uh, that's fine, but even better if you, you set up in, in the model your own firm's financial statements, because then people can relate to it. Uh, they will, it will catch their interest and they will you know, uh, start uh, liking the, the model better because it makes a lot of sense. It makes a ton of sense to uh, have a model show the actual, as it would look in the financial reports, right? Then when they are corresponding, that, that, will, that will be a good thing. And, and uh, you can forget about the T accounts. We're not going to do that. They, those are banned here in this YouTube channel. We're, we're not gonna be bothered by the debits and the credits at all. It's an analytical approach to accounting, you know, spreadsheet-based application where we're just making sure that the balance sheet balances in the model without uh, a flood. So this um, this is ruled out. We're, we're not going to do T accounts, but we might consider setting up a, a chart of accounts just for the sake of, of uh, some discipline. Then, like this is what we have. Then we can expand that as we go along and then add to this, right? So we have the, the usual categories, revenues, expenses, assets, liabilities, and equity. And we did decide what lines we want to include there. So here are three equity lines uh, included, for example, share capital, additional paid in capital, retained earnings. Now these are by no means all the available equity accounts. There you have all these translation reserves and hedging reserves. So, but this is maybe what we choose to work with initially. And then we can add some of the others later if there's a need for, for more detail. We're also going to add our cash flow statement because that is quite necessary for, for the model to uh, come together, right? It's hard to have a complete set of interrelated financial statements without a cash flow statement. So, so for us, that's relevant. And we need to define what's, what's going to be in there as well what, on a need basis. So this is by, by no means a, you know, a, a very realistic, um, Chart of accounts, you could easily add lots more, but this is enough to get to get us going, basically. So then you take this uh, chart of accounts and you implement it in a spreadsheet. So here, for example, you find the three equity lines that we just uh, saw: share capital, additional parent capital, retained earnings. So now we would like to fill this up with content, like build a model, like uh, find a formula that that accurately describes how this uh, balance sheet item would evolve, for example, and make high quality forecasts of all these lines. So that is what we uh, would like to do here now with, uh, with the model. And then at some point we will, uh, like I said earlier, we will introduce variability into these numbers and risk measures and, and that's whole structure for risk analysis, but, but that comes later, right? So for now we're just trying to self-balance it. So, so let's say we have PPE plant property and equipment of a thousand, some cash going in, that is all equity finance. Then there are two events in the first quarter. We depreciate some of the um, PPE and uh, we invest you know, uh, in PPE as well, like some capital expenditure. So these two things uh, happen in the first quarter. All right, so in net income, what will, what will happen? Well, we have to show the depreciation, right? So that will tend to be uh, contributing towards a loss unless uh, anything else goes on. So this will travel through the net income statement producing a loss. In the cash flow statement, self-balancing the model implies, first of all, reversing it because it's not going to be cash effective. It's just an accounting device, right? So the effect on cash flow from that is zero. There is a cash effect on the other hand from, from investment in plant property and equipment that, that reflects actual cash flows that, that are going out you know, as we acquire these, uh, these assets. So this will indeed lead to uh, 
an overall change in cash. You know, we're, we're paying out some actual money here. Um, then we have set it up in such a way that plant property and equipment will decrease by, by this number. We're depreciating this asset, right? But at the same time, we're adding this. We're investing in PPE. And the net is a positive number, right? 25. So overall, you know, plant property and equipment will increase by 25. Whereas cash will need to decrease because the change here is negative, right? So we started out by 200. And um, uh, after this uh, sort of cash transaction where we acquire uh, new assets, you know, there's uh, 75 left. On the liability side, asset, uh, sorry, the equity side, the share capital is unchanged, but the loss in net income shows up here as a loss, right? And producing a, a very nicely, uh, an overall total liabilities and equity that is identical to assets, because that is what we always have to do. We have to check. Now, is this the case? What's the difference here? It's zero. That is what we want. So that is good news. But the important thing is that it balances by design. It's not a coincidence, right? And we didn't need a plug. We didn't force the model to, uh, to get there. So. And this is the principle that we're going to stick to throughout all of this. And, and this looks like perhaps a, a very trivial example, like who wouldn't know this? Well, but this is just a basic principle. Once you start adding complexity here, you know, you introduce impairments, you introduce uh, derivatives, it quickly becomes a tad more advanced, right? And, and, and you need to think thoroughly about, well, how can I make this model keep balancing like, like it does here, because that's what it takes, right, for this to work. So, and we're going to show how to do that in later videos. This was, uh, of course, just an introduction to the, the, some of these principles, and, and we'll come back to how exactly this would look as you build up an actual model. All right, so you, you, need, you, you benefit greatly from account, having accounting integrity in your risk model. And that means essentially that it balances by design, no plug, Needed. So, and good practice is to make sure always that whenever you add something new to the model, it continues to, to balance, right? So, so that, that it allows you to eliminate lots of errors and you learn in the process. Trust me, the, the learning is fantastic as you go about this. And you end up with a model that has an unprecedented amount of reliability. People will quickly see this and you will become a very trusted person who operates a model that is sort of a has this feature. So, so the usefulness for decision support is, uh, is great. So, so that gives us uh, plenty of, of good reasons to, to do this. All right, thank you so much for listening. Please read more in, in my books here, Corporate Foreign Exchange Risk Management or Empowered Enterprise Risk Management. There's also information on riskquality.se and please like and subscribe. Have a good day.